Good morning, church, and Happy New Year. I hope that everyone had a chance to get some rest and have some time with either friends or family, all from a safe distance, and maybe have some turkey or some lamb, as the case uh, may be, certainly at our house. Um, so Happy New Year. It's great to be together. Looking forward to all that 2021 brings. Uh, God's been speaking to me about this coming season, and I'll be sharing about that next week. Uh, but this week, we have the privilege and the pleasure of listening to Jacob, who, as you know, is a man filled with the word, filled with the spirit, full of integrity, strong and gentle and clear. And uh, I, I always come away from listening to Jacob thinking I have been strengthened and I've been encouraged and I've been sharpened. So let's open our minds and open up our hearts, open our spirit to hear the sharp word of God from our friend and our brother, Jacob. Bring 
you more than words I enter the gates Come reckless with praise I'll bring a heart that wants you first All for your glory I enter the gates With nothing but thanks I want to magnify your worth I want to bring you more than words I enter the gates I come reckless with praise I bring a heart that wants you first all for your glory. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, for your glory. Oh, it's all for your glory. Yeah, yeah. Sing my soul. Sing, my soul will sing. My soul will make this place an altar, make this place an altar, sing, my soul will sing, my soul will make this place an altar, make this place an altar, sing, my soul will sing, my soul will make this place an altar, make this place an altar, sing, my soul will sing, my soul will magnify your words I want to bring you more than words I enter the gates come reckless with praise I bring a heart that wants you first all for your glory I enter the gates with nothing but thanks I want to magnify your words I want to bring you more than words I enter the gates I come reckless with praise I Bring a heart that wants you first, all for your glory.
Good morning again, church. Uh, instead of taking up tithes and offerings like we normally do um, at the beginning of the year, I wanted to just take a moment, just looking back at 2020. And I just want to, instead of taking up tithes and offerings, I just want to say on behalf of the leadership at All Nations Church, thank you. Thank you to all of you who gave so faithfully, so willingly, uh, so joyfully during what was probably not the most pleasant year uh, and one certainly filled with uncertainty. But our giving has been uh, consistent and has even grown and the, the body of Christ has been extremely faithful. And for that, I just wanna say uh, thank you on behalf of the leaders, on behalf of the church. Uh, we are grateful uh, to the faithfulness of God in his house and everyone listening to this has been a part of that. So thank you, and uh, now we're gonna turn to the word. Good day, church. I would like to extend to you a happy new year, 2021, on behalf of the pastoral team of the All Nations Church. I hope you and your family were able to celebrate the Christmas season in spite of the challenges that we are all going through collectively during the COVID-19 season. As we enter 2021, we enter so with a renewed hope. We have hope that with the help of God and with some of the breakthroughs that we see in medical science, that this challenging season is soon going to be behind us. When I was thinking about what I should share with the church family this new year, what came to mind is the reminder that God is still on the move. 2021, without a doubt, is going to stand as one of the major challenges that all of us have faced collectively in our lifetimes. But I want to remind you, and I want to remind myself, that this season does not put the plan of God on pause, but that God is still determined and that God is still moving ahead with His purposes and His plans for your life, for my life, for the church, and for the whole world. One of the things that I want to share with you this morning is the importance for us to be prepared and ready for what God has in store for us. Because I'm quite sure that God wants to take us to a new level this 2021. So please, I'll invite you to open your Bible and join me in the book of Exodus. We're going to start from Exodus 23. I'm going to read from Exodus 23. I'm going to read verse 20 and then verse 27 to 30. Exodus 23, verse 20, then verse 27 to 30. I read from the NIV. See, I am sending an angel ahead of you to guard you along the way and to bring you to the place I have prepared. Verse 27, I will send my terror ahead of you and throw into confusion every nation you encounter. I will make all your enemies turn their back and run. I will send the hornet ahead of you to drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites, the Hittites out of your way. But I will drive them, but I will not drive them out in a single year because the land will become desolate and the wild animals too numerous for you. Little by little, I will drive them out before you until you have increased to take possession of the land. Permit me to read the last two verses again. Verse 29. But I will not drive them out in a single year because the land will become too desolate and wild animals too numerous for you. Little by little, I will drive them out before you until you have increased enough to take possession of the land. I just want to give a backdrop of the portion of scripture that we've just read in the book of Exodus. In the portion of scripture we saw, we meet the people of God after God has rescued them from the land of Egypt. We all know the miraculous signs and wonders that God did in order to persuade Pharaoh and the oppressors to let them go. We also recall how God took them 
to the edge of the Red Sea, and how Pharaoh thought that the people of God were stuck, and that they were lost, and he brought his army to recapture them and to take them back into captivity. And we know how God, in his miraculous power, took the people through the Red Sea and forever prevented Pharaoh and his enemies to take hold of the people of God. So now God has taken them there on the other side of the Red Sea. And this is where we pick up from. Where God now is explaining to them the strategy that he's going to use to take them to the promised land. And the strategy that he's going to use to give them that which belongs to them. There are a couple of things that I want to highlight here. These people had been in captivity for 400 years. And God had given a promise to Abraham that he was going to deliver them. You would think that after such a mighty deliverance and after such a long time in which they've been in captivity, that God will immediately take them to the promised land. But God said this in the portion of scripture we read. The first thing that I want you to take note of is that God made it clear that the promised land indeed belongs to them. That this is their inheritance and this is a promise that he had made to the ancestor Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob as well. And God made it clear that it is his intention to give them this land because it belongs to them. They are entitled to it. It is their birthright. It is their inheritance. The next thing that I want you to highlight that God made it clear to them is that the enemy and the obstacles on their way is not going to be a problem because he himself, their God, their protector, their defender, was going to take care of all the obstacles on the way. And God said he was going to send the hornet, his army, ahead of them. That the army is going to put terror and fear in the heart of every person that they are going to meet on the way. And that God himself was going to fight for them to ensure that they take hold of the promised land that God had promised to Abraham. Now, this is where I want us to settle today and what I'm going to be teaching on. is the part where God said that he is capable of pushing out the enemy in a single year, but that he's not going to do it. And God said he's going to do it little by little. And then God went further and explained to his people why he's not going to do it in a single year, even though he's capable of doing it. To summarize, God basically said this. You guys are not prepared. You guys are not ready. You guys are not capable to take care of the land. So even though I, your God, have this promise, and I know you are entitled to this land, I'm not going to drive out the people all at once. I'm going to do it little by little until you are prepared, until you are matured, until you've grown in stature and number so that you can take care of this inheritance. I'm not going to drive out these people. I just want you to think of the implications of what this means, some of the implications. So you can see the people of God crying out to God that God should push out the Philistines that God should push out the Canaanites, that God should push out the Hittites. And you can imagine God responding, yes, I am capable of doing that. Yes, I eagerly and desperately want to give you guys all the land, but I'm not going to do it. Not because I'm not capable, but because you are not prepared, because you are not ready, because you, you do not have the statue or you do not have the ability to steward the responsibility that I have for you, and therefore I'm going to hold back for you, from you until you are ready and you are prepared to take it. You can imagine the people of God crying out to God, Oh God, increase our influence, increase our tent, increase our field of ministry. And God again will respond and say, Yes, I desperately want to do it. I completely agree with you. But for your sake, I'm not going to do it. Because this influence that you are asking for, the ministry that you are asking for, it's going to so overwhelm you that it's going to become a curse, a problem, instead of a blessing that I intended it to be. 
I want you to think of your life as an individual. I want you to think of your family. But I also want you to, for us to think as a church, a group of people whom God has called and entrusted with so much precious promises. When I think across the churches, we know for sure and we celebrate that God has given us the city of Ottawa. We celebrate and we know for sure that God has given us all the cities along Highway 401 through a prophetic word. We celebrate and we know that God desires for us to become that light on the hill that people are going to come to and ask us to show him or to show them the ways of our God. We all understand this. We all embrace these promises. But I believe God is saying the same thing to us today in this season, in 2021 and the years ahead, that the most important thing that we can do in order to facilitate and to see the promises that God has and the prophetic words that God has come to pass is that we have to get ready. We have to become prepared for what God has in store for us. I have come to realize that the enemy or the devil is often not the obstacle that prevents me, that prevents you, or that prevents the church from taking hold of the promises that God has in store for us. It's not the enemy that's the obstacle for us in taking hold of the inheritance and to see them come to pass in our day. God has taken care of the enemy and God is more than able to take care of the enemy. But God says, no, the problem is that Jacob, my people, my church, you may not be prepared. You may not be ready. You may not have the character or the ability to steward the responsibility that I have in store for you. And that's why I'm going to hold back. And that's why I'm going to give it to you little by little. And therefore, for me this year, as we enter 2021, and as we look ahead to the years ahead, we have to ask ourselves, what is the most important investment that we can make as a church? What is the most important investment that you can make on us as an individual? What's the most important investment that I can make with my family? And I want to submit to you that God is asking us, just like he asked his people of time of old, that I need you to get prepared. I need you to invest in getting prepared. I need you to invest in becoming mature so that you can properly steward the responsibilities that I have for you. And God is saying that I so desperately want to give this to you. There's just so much more that I want to show you, that I want to reveal to you. There's just so much more that I want to entrust to my people. That you guys are holding me back because you are not prepared, because you are not mature, because you are not ready to take care of it. I just want to share with us today as a church uh, four different ways in which we can ensure that we are ready. Four different ways in which we can position ourselves to start welcoming in the fullness the promises of God that He has over our lives as individuals, that He has over our families and over our church. The first thing that I believe that we can do as the people of God is that we have to learn how to embrace the process of God. You see, God gives us promises and then there's a fulfillment and the realization of the promises that God has given us. Now, in between the promise that God has given us and between the fulfillment, often there's this gap in between, or if you like, this chasm, which I like to call the process of God is that God has a process. You know, we, at times, we are so caught up with the promises. We do celebrate them. We dance about them. We talk about them. And so often, we want to jump from the promises of God to the fulfillment and the realization of the promises of God, which is good. But God, on the other hand, places as much value as the process of growing our character of growing us in maturity, of teaching us to become more responsible steward, to ensure that once we get to that land, the promised land, 
or the fulfillment, we are capable of stewarding the things that God has given us. And I think that is what we often forget, we often mistake. And at times we think that the promises of God are not true, or that the promises of God are tiring. It's because God wants to take us through this process. You know, um, a process, like most of us will acknowledge, is not always comfortable. The process of God at times is filled with discomfort. I mean, think of the people that left Egypt. They had to go through the desert. The desert is not a habitable place. The desert is full of, of uh, 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 life-threatening situations. Uh, there wasn't any shelter. Uh, there wasn't any food. They were beaten each day by the sun. And they had to cry out to God. And therefore, no one wants to go through discomfort. But do you know that this was the process of God in order to grow, in, in order to grow them, in order to build character, in order to build endurance, perseverance, in order to equip them with the skill sets that they need in order to survive when they get into the promised land? The process of God is also full with opposition. You know, just because we are in the promise of God and we are walking towards the fulfillment of the promise of God, at times we can be mistaken to think that opposition is an indication that we are going against the will of God or that we are outside of the promises of God. But that is far from true because we know and we understand that God uses discomfort and God uses opposition in order to forge and to shape and to mold us into the image of Christ, to shape and to mold us into all that which he intends us to be. I was thinking about King David. We all celebrate David, the mighty King David. But do you know that he was anointed king several years before he ever was appointed king and that he had to go through the process of God and the process involves Saul threatening his life, chasing him day and night to kill him. And at times it's difficult to see where God was, uh, where God was in the midst of all of this. But God had to build him up. God had to forge his character. God had to teach him how to be king. God had to prepare him. God had to prove him. And so let's not get confused between the promise and the fulfillment or between the anointing and the appointment is that, yeah, God wants to appoint us. God wants us to walk in the fullness of his promises. God wants us to embrace them, not only to, to, to prophesy or to celebrate them, but God also wants to mature us through his process. I'm quite sure that 2021 will present you as an individual, your family, and us as a church as several opportunities of discomfort and opposition. But I want to encourage you and I want to remind you that God is in the midst of this opposition and discomfort and that God is going to use this process to build us to become a stronger people, a stronger church, and a stronger household. The second thing which I think we can do to be prepared and to be ready is that we must become people who do not avoid difficult situations. Adversity is not always from the enemy. The natural thing that we can do when we face adversity, discomfort and opposition is just to take ourselves out of the situation because that is natural, that is comfortable. But it is helpful that we understand that adversity presents great opportunity for growth. I want us to look at another scripture on the journey of the people of God out of Egypt. I invite you to open with me to Exodus 13 from 17. Exodus 13 from 17 to 18. I'm reading again from the NIV. When Pharaoh let the people go, 
God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around the desert towards the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt, ready for battle. There are a couple of things that are clear to us here. First, it was God who was leading the people. It wasn't the enemy. And it was God who led them to the desert. And it was God who led them to the Red Sea. You know, as soon as God delivered them out of Egypt, God presented his people with an adversity. The Red Sea on the one side, and Pharaoh and his armies on the other side. And of course, the natural response of the people of God was to take themselves out of their adversity. The first thing they did was to cry out to Moses and Aaron, didn't we tell you guys to leave us in Egypt? It would have been better if we stay as slaves and serve Pharaoh and die. Because they saw adversity, their first reaction was to take themselves out. But God had another plan. God wanted to build their confidence and their trust in Him. And therefore God miraculously showed His power again, once and for all. He opened the Red Sea and they walked on dry ground. And God gave them a mighty victory. God uses adversity to forge our character. God uses adversity to mold us, to shape us, to bring out the best out of us. Even in the world, we know it's often said that adversity or challenges is the mother of invention. And this is true. And this is not different in the house of the Lord. This is not different from the people of God. Is that God uses this to bring the best out of us. I want to advise you. And I want to advise myself that whenever you find yourself in difficulty, whenever you find yourself in adversity, do not go back to Egypt. You know, Egypt represents not only sin and oppression, but Egypt for the people of God also represents that which is familiar. You know, at times adversity might just be change. You know, we are scared of change. We are scared to try something new. We are scared to take a step of faith into the unknown. And therefore, what we do is that we retreat back to that place that is familiar, that place that is uncomfortable, even though that place is not life-giving, even though that place oppresses us, even though that place, you know, uh, uh, limits our ability, limits our good, limits what God has for us. We have a tendency to retreat back because it's comfortable. We want to go back to Egypt. Whenever the people of God faced adversity in the desert, that was the first thing that came to their mind. Take us back to Egypt. In fact, on one time they revolted and they wanted to elect and select new leaders that would take them back to oppression, that would take them back to slavery because they faced difficult situation. They completely forgot that they were on the path to the fulfillment of their promise that God himself was leading them and that God was there in the midst of the adversity. So I want to encourage you, as part of our preparation, as part of us getting ready and showing God that we are mature enough to steward the promises that he has for us, we must be people who do not run away from adversity. We'll embrace them and we trust that God is going to use adversity to form us into all that which he wants us to be. The third thing that I want us to consider, and which was pretty clear, as God took his people from Egypt towards the promised land, is that God wanted to teach them to learn how to trust him. To trust him. One of the major complaints that God had against Israel was that they just did not trust him. And how quickly they forgot who he was and everything that he can do and everything that he had done. And that really break the heart of God. It really break the heart of the Father. That his people would quickly abandon him when they face challenges. 
the hallmark of those who are mature, the hallmark of those who are ready and prepared to steward the promises of God is that they have learned to trust God even in the midst of difficulties. Is that they have learned to trust God even when it doesn't make sense, when things don't add up. Is that when they believe that God has spoken and that they've heard God clearly, then they have to get up and march on with God because they know that God is with them and God is always going to make a way. God is always going to defeat the enemy. God is always going to keep his promises and see things through because that is who he, that is, who he is. You know, God says if we choose to become unfaithful, he cannot become unfaithful. He cannot deny himself. Faithfulness is the personal attribute and nature of God. That God does not lie. God does not change his mind. And that if God has spoken, then God is going to see it through. One of the stories that I love that relates to this is the story of when Jesus met Peter and his friends. You know, Jesus borrowed their boat and Jesus preached a sermon to over 5,000 people. And when Jesus was done, uh, Jesus wanted to recognize their generosity. So Jesus asked Peter and his friends that they should go again into the deep to cast their net. Now, I want you to understand that Peter and his friends were professional fishermen. That was their job. They knew when to go out, where to go, when to cast their net. And they had done that the whole night. In fact, Peter testified to Jesus that we have done all that. I also want you to realize that it just did not make sense for Peter to listen to Jesus about fishing. Yeah, maybe he would listen to Jesus about carpentry or about the gospel and about God, but Jesus was not a fisherman. But I love how Peter ended. He says, even though it doesn't make sense, even though it's irrational, illogical, but at your word, because you have said so, I'm going to do it. And Peter and his friends and colleagues went out. They cast their net, as Jesus said, exactly where Jesus said. And they came out with a mighty harvest. So I just want to encourage you, my brothers and sisters. Things may not always look the way they seem. In the midst of difficulty, challenges, especially this 2021 that we are entering, still in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. But I want to remind you to trust your God. For he has promised that he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He has promised that uh, if we go through the fire, he is there with us. If we go through the water, he is there with us. There are certain situations that God had chosen that we have to go through. And he has promised that he is going to be there with us. So I want to encourage you to be hopeful. I want to encourage you to remain in faith. I want to encourage you to hold on to your hope. That God is faithful and God is going to see you through. The last thing that I want to share with you, my brothers and sisters, that we can do to ensure that we are prepared, we are ready to steward the responsibility that God has for us, to steward the promises of God, to welcome them, um, is that we have to be faithful with that which God has entrusted to us. Each and every one of us, individuals, family, and also the church, we have something that God has already entrusted to us. The question is, what are we doing with that? And how is that going? You know, at times we have the mindset that we are insignificant. Or we have the mindset that whatever we are responsible for is not important enough for us to give it our full attention, for us to be diligent with it. But you know, everything that God has entrusted to you, everything that God has entrusted to your family, everything that God has entrusted to us as a church, in spite of how small it may seem, it's important and relevant and advances the purposes of God in our day. So the question again is, how well are we stewarding that? For some of us as well, is that we look at what God has given us and we put it aside that it's not big enough. We want God to start us 
at the bigger stage, at the bigger area of influence, with the bigger ministry. But do you know that's not how God works? You know, God told these people that he is going to drive out the people that occupy the inheritance little by little until they are ready, until they are prepared. And because God wants to see how well they are going to take care of the little things that God has given them. It's not because God is not capable to push them out all in a day. God is more than able to drive them. God is more than able to give them the land. But God says, I will do it little by little so that he can see how faithful we are with the little things that he has given us. One of the portions of scripture that I really love that speaks to this is a parable from our Lord himself. The Lord gave this parable, and I'm not going to read everything, but I'll encourage you to look at it. The parable is in Luke, and Luke 19. I'm going to read just from verse 24. It says, Then, turning to the others standing nearby, the king ordered, Take the money from this servant, and give it to the one that has ten pounds. But master, they said, he already had ten pounds. Yes, the king replied, to those who use well what they are giving, even more will be given to them. But for those who do nothing, even with the little that they have, it will be taken away. And this is the parable that we called in the church the parable of talents. And it took me several years in the church before I have a true appreciation of this. Because it seems to go against the grain of the God that we are taught. The idea that God can take from one who has little or who has almost nothing and God can give to that that has so many. But this is also in the scripture and the gospel that we have received. And the context here is that if we are not faithful, if we do not steward that which God has given us, even the little that we have, God is going to take it away from us. And God is going to entrust it to those who have proven faithful. Even though they seem to have so much, God is going to give it to them. That's the God that we serve. God values faithfulness. God values stewardship. God values good management. God values diligence. So I want to encourage myself and I want to encourage you that as we enter 2021, I want you to evaluate everything that God has put you in charge of. I want you to evaluate your life and the promises of God over your life. I want you to evaluate your family and the promises and dreams of God over your family. I want us as a church to evaluate the prophetic words and the promises that we have over us. And I want us again to take hold of these things with a renewed faith, with a renewed confidence, with a renewed hope as we enter 2021 and in the years ahead. And knowing that God values faithfulness and that as we faithfully carry out the work that God has given us, we have no doubt that God is going to do his own part, just like he had promised, that he's going to give us increased responsibility, increased influence, increased prosperity, increased blessing, and that we are all going to prosper under the leadership of King Jesus. So once more, my brothers and sisters, I want to wish you a happy New Year 2021. And I want to remind you that the plan and the purposes of God are in motion. Not even a challenging season like COVID-19 can hold the plan and the purposes of God. And I want to remind and encourage you that one of the most effective things we can do as the people of God is to invest in our readiness, is to invest in our preparation, 
and that the four ways that we can do it is first we want to embrace the process of God and that secondly we are not people who shy away from adversity or difficult situations and that thirdly we are those who trust God even in the midst of hardship and that lastly we are those who are going to be found faithful with the little things that God has given us and that if we do all these things individually as families and collectively as the body of Christ then we are truly going to become the light on the hill that God has dreamt for us to be. May God bless you and your family. Have a nice day. If you've just joined us this morning and you've just realized that God has been pursuing you your entire life, then I just want to encourage you that this is a good day for you. This is a good day to decide to make Jesus the Lord of your life. The Bible says that if you repent and believe the good news that you'll be saved. And that just means repentance means just to turn away, to turn from the fact that you didn't know that God had been pursuing you your entire life and that suddenly you were just illuminated to the fact that he loves you and that he's been pursuing you and to turn towards him. And so if that's you today, I just want to encourage you just to pray this simple prayer with me. Father, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for never giving up on me. Today, I want to make you the Lord of my life. Wash me from all my sins and make me a brand new creation. I receive your peace in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if that's you this morning, if you've just made that decision, we are so excited for you. Do you know that all around right now, all around you, what you can't see is that angels and saints are blowing trumpets. They're having a huge party in your honor that God the Father, he loves you, he has a great plan and a great purpose for your life. If you've just made that, we want to celebrate with you. I just want to encourage you to click the live prayer button at the bottom of your screen or to click the connect with us button at the top of your screen and let us know that you've just made this life-changing decision to follow Jesus.